Hello Unity fans and welcome back to my game development series. In the last video, we started adding a performant minimap to the game. I wanted something that would take a negligible amount of system resources while still looking good and being functional. As part of these efforts, I have also been studying up on and testing optimization. Remember that this is really my very first game development experience, so there are lots of knowledge and many techniques to consider as I'm progressing and learning. More experienced developers will no doubt be able to identify bad ways of doing things in my previous and future videos, but I do feel the last few weeks of considering optimization has awarded me with an enormous amount of very impactful knowledge. It has been mind-blowing to see how much one small factor can drag down or improve the frame rate. In the next few videos, I'll be discussing some of these factors, kicking off with dynamically creating LODs or levels of detail for the randomly created terrain meshes themselves. While more and more triangles are needed to create smoother and more detailed models, that comes at a system resource cost. Triangulating and displaying detailed terrain takes a lot longer than triangulating and displaying more elementary terrain. Where our terrain contains terraces and cliffs, and in combination with the randomness we're adding to make the terrain less monotone, considerably more triangles are required to draw the terrain. But when these more detailed hexes are far away in the distance, most of that detail is all but indistinguishable from more elementary triangulations. This means that we could display less detailed versions of this terrain in these cases. Unity allows us to implement a level of detail or LOD system quite easily. By creating a LOD group, setting up its parameters and specifying the different meshes to be displayed by each LOD, Unity automatically handles switching between the LODs based on the relative size of the meshes on the screen. The quality settings also contain an overall multiplier for LOD distances. So, all LODs can be adjusted at once to switch at larger or smaller relative sizes. To implement this system into our terrain meshes, we add an array of LOD transitions to our mesh. Whenever this array isn't empty, we create LOD versions of our mesh's vertices, cell indices, cell weights, UVs and triangles. We will use these exactly like we did for the main mesh. They will just contain much simpler meshes. Next, we set up the material and create a LOD group with settings indicating we don't want fading between the LODs. We'll actually only use one extra LOD level, but the script is written to be able to handle more. So, for each LOD level, we set up a mesh, its renderer, and LOD options. When everything is set up, we apply the LOD group. Next, throughout the hex mesh script, we now add the same functionality for the new LODs as we had for the main mesh. This includes setting up the list pools, applying them and adding triangles, quads, UVs and cell data to them. All that remains now is populating these meshes, although this is the most difficult part. The terrain gets triangulated in the hex grid chunk script. For all the different possible configurations for triangulating a hex, a less detailed version needs to also be triangulated in the LOD mesh. For examples of how this was done for the minimap, which can be even less detailed, check out the video linked to in the top right. We apply the same idea here. For example, in the detailed version, we've split each segment edge fan into four triangles to give the edges some variability. However, at distance, we don't have to divide the segment fan into four different triangles since we don't need the variation, so we can use one triangle only. The same goes for cliffs and terraces. We could use a single cliff face per cliff, and even replace the terraces by cliff faces only, since the terraces aren't required at distance. However, you would have noticed that we sometimes do have to triangulate what I call the HD version of the terrain, even in the lower detail lot. But why? Well, each chunk decides which level of detail it should be displaying depending on its relative size on the screen. However, if low detail hexes on the edge of one chunk have to connect to high detail hexes on the edge of the neighboring chunk, there are slight gaps in the terrain. For example, you'd be trying to connect a segment's edge fan consisting of a single triangle 
to one consisting of four triangles, leaving some gaps where the detailed edge fan contains variability. And it becomes worse where cliffs and terraces are involved, where the edges can become quite detailed. To alleviate this problem, we always triangulate the segments that border other chunks in high detail, to ensure the connection with the neighboring chunk isn't compromised. In addition, all the various triangulations impacted by rivers also need to be catered for, but eventually we have a complete set of low detail triangulations, catering for all the possible high detail triangulations. As we zoom in and out, we can see how the chunks of 8x8 hexes switch between low detail and high detail. Of course, we can set the parameters so that the switching happens at a smaller relative size, to make it far less noticeable. We just set the lot transition in the terrain mesh of the hex grid chunk prefab. Note that we don't create low detail versions of the rivers, roads and water, since these are already quite low detail in terms of number of triangles so we don't stand to really gain anything. So, how many frames per second did this add for us? Actually, on my system, a solid zero. Let's have a look at the stats. We can see that the number of vertices and triangles are considerably reduced when implementing the terrain lots. However, for my system, this does not lead to any discernible change in frames per second. That's probably because the game is pretty low poly to start off with, so 2.2 million triangles really isn't that much. When I get the chance to test the game on multiple systems, I will make sure to include testing for this feature on some lower end GPUs to find out where it starts having a real impact. Either way, I learned a lot about LODs and meshes during this implementation, and creating them procedurally may come in handy in the future. But you don't have to go away empty handed, I do have something small for you that did actually have a large impact on the frame rate, the chunk size. We originally started off with each chunk containing 5x5 five five hexes. So each group of 25 hexes was triangulated in its own chunk, and any change to one of these required a retriangulation of the entire chunk. On small maps the chunk size does not have much of an impact, since the map consists of relatively few chunks. But when we move to larger maps, this actually had a surprisingly large impact. I tested chunk sizes of 5x5, 10x10 and 20x20 hexes, and here are the results. With a chunk size of 25 or 5x5, we get around 60 to 70 FPS on a large map. Increasing the number of hexes per chunk fourfold to 100 or 10x10 gives us between 80 and 90 FPS. I found this large difference quite surprising, so let's repeat this to get 400 hexes per chunk, or 20 by 20. This time, the FPS increases only slightly, around 85 to 95. However, there is another factor to keep in mind when choosing a chunk size. Whenever a chunk needs to be retriangulated, we don't want that to be too noticeable. Our terrain will actually be lowered and raised as part of the game, and we don't want a hiccup in the graphics each time this happens. Also, when editing the terrain, we want the editing to be smooth and not skip areas. Here we can see that simply changing the terrain type on the 20x20 chunk size leads to some areas being skipped, while for a 10x10 and 5x5 chunk size it's a lot smoother. When changing elevations or adding trees, this becomes more of an issue. So I've opted to go with a chunk size of 8x8 or 64 hexes. This doesn't cost too much in terms of frames per second and also leads to fast chunk triangulation when changing elevations and other characteristics. And finally, using a power of 2 always feels comforting, doesn't it? And that's it for today's video. In the next video we'll consider some more optimization, specifically showing how using optimized game assets and materials drastically increases frame rate when having large numbers of models on the map. Please consider subscribing to continue on this exciting journey with me. Goodbye!